Well, two out in the bottom of the ninth. And they bring a closer in from Washington, D.C. to finish up today's TED conference. Uh, they probably did that because they know when people come from Washington, D.C., we're here for two reasons, A, to help you, and B, to tell you the truth. So I'm delighted to be here uh, uh, today. Uh, I left Bowling Green in 1975, and for the past 36 years, I've worked in the national security arena, uh, primarily dealing with uh, very bad people doing very bad things. Uh, I spent a lot of time tracking people who are uh, playing around with nuclear weapons, uh, chemical weapons, uh, biological weapons. I uh, was recently involved in a project, which I can't talk about here today, but it was finding a very tall man who was living behind some very high walls in Pakistan. And it took a long time to find him. And the next project right now is finding a shorter man who likes to wear very odd clothing. And I think he's probably somewhere in South Niger tonight. Uh, and, and I would guess in the next week we'll, we'll find him too. Uh, what I wanted to do today is talk to you about some sort of a parallel uh, issues. And one of it is using national security assets to, to address a very, very difficult question that we're facing right now in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, a little while ago, the Army came to a group of us at the University of Maryland, and they said, uh, you've got to help us find these insurgents who are planting roadside bombs in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, about 90% of the injuries, uh, both death and the horrible maimings that are going on of US troops, uh, both men and women, in those two fields of uh, battle, are being caused by these roadside bombs. And the Army came to us and said, try and figure out a way that we can target where these people are building these bombs and where they're living. And so that has been sort of the project we've been working on for the past couple years. And, and I'm very happy to tell you that we have some spectacular results on that. And, and let me tell you how we found out and did that. And then I'm going to apply those results to my other passion in life and that is trying to protect some of the endangered animals of the world. Uh, when we decided to sit down and start thinking about how to attack this problem of finding these insurgents, uh, there is no uh, number of uh, options that were tried. They tried putting cameras up, they had on the, uh, people on the roads watching uh, for where these bombs were being planted, and none of it was working. Uh, we were being outsmarted by the terrorists. Uh, Professor Poor, when he was talking with Jules Verne here today, he brought out a number of laws. And I have one basic law that I use for all my studies, and that's the law of Winnie the Pooh. And, and, and you laugh about this, and, this is, and, and I'm not going to go into a long discussion of science and Winnie the Pooh since I'm the only standing, thing standing between you and an adult beverage tonight. Uh, so, so we're going to truncate this a little bit. But I've often said that if you really want to learn about science, and problem solving, read the first paragraph of Winnie the Pooh. And I'll go over it here very quickly for you. And if nothing else from this talk today, remember the first paragraph of Winnie the Pooh the next time you have an exam question or a paper to write, because I think it will give you some insight. Here is Edward Bear coming down the stairs now, bump, 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs but sometimes he feels that there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think about it. That's problem solving right there, isn't it? We've got a problem. This is science. We've got a problem coming downstairs. We have a hypothesis. There must be a better way. We also have the null hypothesis. Perhaps there isn't another way. But what does this demand for us? Testing and thinking about better ways to come down steps. So when we, our team got together and we started thinking about this problem of insurgents planting these bombs, we put the Winnie the Pooh method into effect. I, I have been very lucky to travel to, I think last count was 82 countries, and, and I spend a lot of my time in those areas uh, tracking animals because I find tracking animals helps me track humans. And I learn from their behavioral patterns and it helps me when I have to do analysis of bad people in the world trying to sneak around. Uh, this was taken uh, up in northern India, and this is my good friends, uh, the gorilla family up in Uganda where I was last year. And, and I spent a lot of time with these animals, and, and the fact is there's only about 3,000 tigers left in, in the world. And 
for the gorillas, all the gorillas in the world would fill up this auditorium. That's all that's left. About 780 uh, mountain gorillas left in the wild. So when you think about when you came in here first thing today for, for Ted, uh, you represented uh, one of the last, the group of gorillas on, on Earth. So what, what we decided to do was to use uh, one of the nation's best intelligence tools, and that's an intelligence satellite you see up on the top right. When you heard the earlier talk today about making movies, and maybe the make movie will make a movie of you, I do. I make movies of you every single day. Uh, I can see down to 16 inches. Uh, that's from 423 miles in space. The satellite's moving 35 miles a second. Uh, if I were to stand up here and, and put my arms out and put home plate on my chest, uh, there's a 99% uh, accuracy rate that we would get the picture of home plate on my chest. So there's very few things that you can hide uh, uh, from us. Very accurate. Uh, every pixel has a GPS coordinate on it, so we're able to uh, very uh, uh, carefully map, and we have expertise and access anywhere in the world. Now, the only constant in, the wor in our world is change. And what we try and do is measure change and find out how change applies to human behavior and animal behavior. And we've been doing that now to look for this terrorist thing. Uh, one of our more recent projects has been in Japan, and I'll go over this very quickly. This is the area of uh, uh, the Yoshika Peninsula the day before, and this is the day after. Now, that's telling in that, again, you can go down to 16 inches on these if I had a big enough screen here, and you can see the change. And that's what we tried to start doing with uh, the national security apparatus and looking at uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So. By getting this daily satellite feed, we were able to develop a map of Baghdad, for example, down, as I said, to 16 inches, uh, very precise location, terrain, we could find enemy positions, where the IEDs were detonated, uh, where the civilians were living around the area, and then we were able to timely and accurately trace back from when the explosions happened to when certain other behavior happened in, in the area. So the critical issue then is how can we employ some of these assets that are currently being used to save these animals. And here's how we did it in, uh, in, in Baghdad. Uh, before I continue, this is an unclassified briefing and this is unclassified material, just for the record, uh, so I don't end up going to jail. Uh, what we did is, and this is, a, again, it's, it's a large graphic because I don't have the room on this computer, but this is uh, Baghdad the central area of Baghdad. And what we did was we went in and found all the areas where you wouldn't have an explosion. Primarily Sunni neighborhoods, these were Shias that were detonating the bombs, so they're certainly not going to detonate it in that area. They're not going to detonate it in the water, and they're not going to detonate it inside these green areas, which is the coalition facilities. This is the green zone in downtown Baghdad. So what we do is we reduce the amount of error we about the amount of error and area that we have to look at and say for any area inside of Baghdad, these areas is where the bombs will occur. What we did then did is went back and tracked every IED explosion over the past five years and pinpointed them on the maps. On top of that, we overlaid where the US troops were moving during those times when they were hit, what roads they were on. Uh, we then took intelligence from drones and human intelligence, overlaid it on there, and came to a conclusion that in Baghdad, and this is only for Baghdad because of the geographical issues involved here, when an IED blast goes off, there is a 90% chance that the bomb factory is between 685 and 715 meters away from the explosion. Now, does that tell you the exact house? No, but it gives the, on the battlefield commander, if the explosion is here, he goes out 700 yards and starts looking. And what we did to define that is you looked at the patterns of where the insurgents moved, what kind of coverage they had, where they could hide. And we were able to then develop a pattern of behavior for that. 
And then we did it for all other cities in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I had a bump, bump, bump moment in a meeting one day when I said to myself, well, wait a minute. If we're looking for insurgents planting IEDs at U.S. military targets, would this same model work for poachers in Rwanda and Nepal setting out snares to trap tigers and gorillas? At face value, it seemed like that's not a bad idea. Can we test it and find out? Well, we've now done satellite imagery of Bhutan and Nepal, and we're doing it over uh, Rwanda right now. And we're trying to map out where these poachers, poachers are and how to stop them. And what we're finding is, this is a, uh, a forest fire in Colorado. I, can't, I don't have pictures of Bhutan today because the monsoons are going on. And so there's no pictures. But this looks very much like the area in Nepal where the tigers live. You have water, you have small villages, you have roads, you have some heavy dense forest, you have open bush. But you can find the areas where the tigers live. And what we've done is, is we've given all the trackers in the area cell phones. And so every time they go out and see a tiger snare, they take a photo of the snare. That goes GPS, bounces up. Uh, to the satellite, and we are able to then place the snare exactly on the geography of the area of where it happened. Uh, we found where tiger kills are in the area, and what we've been able to do is follow how the tigers move, follow how the gorillas move, see where the snares are, and then extrapolate back using the same algorithms we developed for the insurgents in Iraq, and we're getting pretty close to finding out where the poachers are in these areas. They can't go too far because they're carrying six, seven hundred pounds of bush meat. So the, the, the distance between the kill and where they go is uh, pretty small. So we know, where, we know where gorillas live every day because there's trackers with them. Tigers are harder. Uh, we've recently put some collars on some tiger cubs and we're getting some data from that. But tigers, by definition, do not like to have collars around their necks. Um, and as one who's had to put collars on tiger necks, I don't like putting those said collars on the tiger's necks because I'm not sure they're really asleep and not just closing their eyes to play with me. Um, we identified the snares with GPS. We mapped this. All of it done with satellite imagery. And I can, I'm happy to report that we're getting to the point now where we're overlaying all this data, again, based on the Iraq model, and we're really finding out a place where, using these algorithms, we can go into villages and basically show the villagers a picture of their village and convince them that every day when they go out and try and place snares to catch animals, I'm watching them. And I'm going to catch them. And when I catch them, it's going to be very bad. So what we've done is, in both northern uh, Kenya, in the Liwa Conservancy, and in eastern Namibia, we are running programs to turn poachers into protectors. We're basically paying them to stop killing animals because we've convinced them that it's better to keep these animals alive for ecotourism as, a, as opposed to selling them to, to some Chinese herbalist who wants tiger parts to, to feed the uh, insatiable demand of, of China for these, these animal parts. Testing and evaluation. Uh, in two weeks, I'll be back in South Africa and Namibia. Uh, November, I'll be in Bhutan up in the mountains with a, with a team and in January, uh, I'll be out with the Diane Fossey Foundation in Rwanda, uh, to, again, field testing these to see if, if the, the model works. That's our uh, scientific review committee. Um, I have to present the results to him, and uh, uh, he's a very tough grader. If you think you have a hard professor, you ought to talk to him. Uh, finally, uh, this is a picture I took of uh, a, a gorilla up in the mountains of Uganda last year. I was about three and a half, four feet away from her, and she was looking up into the, uh, uh, the trees looking for food. If you ever get this close to a gorilla and you look in their eyes, your life will change. And you say to yourself, I've got to figure out a way to, to, to help these animals. She did have some words for me as I was leaving, and they, they were just three. So as I left and I said goodbye to her, she looked at me and said, bump, bump, bump. So thank you very much. Try to see it my way. Do I have to keep on?